Associate Professor Julian White is the Head of Toxinology at the Women's and Children's Hospital. He is a graduate of the University of Adelaide and also gained his MD for Studies in Clinical Toxinology in South Australia, also from the University of Adelaide. Julian has an international reputation in his field of expertise. He is a member of the International Society on, on Toxinology and holds the executive positions of Australian Council of the Asia-Pacific Section, Vice President of the Asia-Pacific Association of Medical Toxicology. Now, that is toxicology, not toxinology, yes. right? <laughs> and uh, he's the second... Not a long time ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's the secretary-treasurer of the... International Society on Toxinology, and that is current, is that correct? Well, I'm actually now the president. Oh, well, that's been upgraded. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, Julian is author of numerous scientific papers and book chapters on a variety of the clinical and research aspects of toxinology and is on the editorial board of the Toxicon Journal. He has... Toxicon. Mm. Toxicon, that's it? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Oh, it's not a journal. Hmm? It's not a journal. Yeah, no, oh. Toxicon is a journal. Right, Absolutely. right, yeah, okay. <laughs> He's been a major contributor to the World Health Organization Clinical Safety Intox Program. Julian has developed an international training course in clinical toxinology. The course is based in Australia and draws students from around the world. He's also one of the nation's foremost experts on snake venom, and that's where I first heard of Julian when he gave his talk to the medical scientists many years ago on that topic, and was awarded a member of the Order of Australia in 2016 for significant service to medicine, particularly in the field of toxinology, through his clinical and leadership roles. His booklet, Snake Bite and Spider Bite, Management Guidelines in South Australia, I don't think it's on sale here today, but... It's not <laughs> you... for sale. Oh, well, it's a giveaway. Uh, you get it, you can just download it from the SA Health website. Oh, okay, well, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and that was, pre that was published in 2018. Um, so, and apart from a scientific, his scientific interests, Julian and his wife, Beata, are intimately involved with the arts and particularly opera South Australia. Rotarians and friends, it is my pleasure to present Associate Professor Julian White, AM, to speak on, and I suspect not for the faint hearted, <laughs> things that go bite or sting in the night or day, and an introduction to clinical toxinology. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Kate. So we'll just connect this up and hope that. It all works. That's looking good. So without any further ado, I'll get stuck into my talk. <clears throat> and hopefully you can all see that screen. So Kay asked me to talk a little bit about spiders and spider bite. I actually wanted to talk more about snake bite than spider bite, which is what I'm going to do, but I'm throwing in some photographs of spiders and we'll start out with a, a fairly friendly view of these, these creatures. Um, on one side of the screen you can see a fairly angry Russell's viper with fangs erect. This is a cause of many tens of thousands of snake bites through much of Asia and many deaths. Um, and on the other side, you can see a close-up of a male mouse spider. And you can see there the beautiful fangs, the, the uh, lovely red appearance of this uh, spider. Very attractive things, delightful. Um, this is all the photos of mine, just so you know. Um, I thought we should have a close-up of something a little bit more dangerous than a mouse spider. A mouse spider probably can't kill you. This certainly can. It's a male Sydney funnelweb spider. Um, and you can see the large fangs there. And the fangs of a funnelweb spider are bigger than those of a brown snake. The other spider of importance in Australia is the redback spider, which is one of the world's um, many species of widow spider. Uh, and the redback spider is far more common than funnelweb spiders. Um, it certainly is highly venomous, but it's much less likely to kill you than a funnel web spider. And having said that, I have to tell you that funnel web spider bite 
There was nothing that modern medicine could do to guarantee your survival after a funnel web spider bite before the advent of antivenom. In the beginning of the 80s, uh, an antivenom for funnel web spider was finally developed by CSL, um, and that has radically changed the outlook. So there have been no recorded deaths from funnel web spider since we've had that antivenom available. Um, not all spiders are really dangerous to humans. Nearly all spiders are venomous. Nearly all spiders have eight eyes. And for some, those eyes are not so important in detecting prey. But for others, which are hunters, they're very important indeed. Here's an example of that. This is a close-up of one of our many species of huntsman spider. That's the thing that crawls up on your wall. Um, if you're really unlucky, it's behind the... the um, uh, flap in your car and when you put it down because of the sun, the spider falls in your lap. This is not going to kill you, uh, unless of course it's in the car and you drive into something as a result. <laughs> but the venom um, is, is not potent enough to harm humans. You'll certainly feel the bite, it's probably be painful, um, but it's not dangerous and of course these spiders do a great deal of uh, good in terms of controlling pests. And that photo enables you to, to know, is this a, a male, a daddy spider, or a mummy spider? Can anyone tell me, is it a daddy or a mummy spider? Unisex. No, <laughs> they don't have unisex as far as I know. It's actually a male spider, and the way you can tell are these two front limbs. They're called pedipalps. And in the male, they're swollen and enlarged, as you can see there. And that's because that is used to transfer sperm into the female. So that's how you can tell a male from a female spider. <laughs> Useless piece of information number whatever. Uh, this is another of my favourite spiders. There are many species of wolf spider. This is another hunting spider, as you can tell from its eyes. It's got two big eyes and four smaller ones underneath and then two facing part backwards. So it's quite, quite good forward vision. And this particular one is feeding on a mealworm. They're a common spider. Sure, they can bite. The bite might be painful, but it's not dangerous to humans. Um, and like a number of arthropods, a number of scorpions, for example, and a few other spiders, it's a fairly devoted parent. And you can see here the female has all of the young spiderlings on her back and she'll transport them around for a period of at least a few weeks until they're um, mature enough to go off and find their own lives. I'm not going to talk much about scorpions, but in fact scorpions globally are much more important than spiders in terms of their medical impact. Scorpions in Australia are not dangerous. The sting is certainly can be very painful, but it's not a threat to life. But in a number of parts of the world, scorpion sting is both common and potentially a threat to life, particularly in children. And this is uh, uh, photos of a number of these scorpions that I've seen over the years. Um, you can see the names up there. Uh, Lurus quinquestriatus is known as the death stalker scorpion from North Africa and the Middle East, including Israel. And certainly that has a, a quite a bad reputation for fatal stings, uh, particularly in small children. Androctonus australis next to it is also from North Africa across as far as Morocco. Centroides sculpturatus is the most important, medically important scorpion in North America, particularly in the southern parts say, around Arizona, which is where I saw that particular specimen. Then on the bottom row, you can see Titius cerulatus. This is the most medically important scorpion in Brazil, and it is parthenogenetic. That means you don't need a male scorpion for this to form a colony. And it's my great fear that this scorpion will be accidentally exported to other parts of the world, and we will face the same problems that the Brazilians now face in their big urban centres where this scorpion causes many things, because it's adapted to live in urban areas, including high-rise apartment buildings. And then there's Buthus ossitanus, and lastly, Parabuthus transvalicus from Africa, uh, again, all capable of causing potentially fatal stings. 
To give you an idea of the numbers, another species of centuroides um, found in Mexico causes approximately 300,000 plus presentations to Mexican hospitals every year because of serious scorpion envenoming. And they used to have thousands of deaths a year, but they now have a good antivenom, and so deaths even in children are fortunately a rarity. So that shows you a few photos of these animals, um, and we're going to talk more about snakes in, in a moment. But in fact, toxin-producing animals, um, or organisms, I should say, are really quite diverse and widespread. So amongst the venomous animals, we have those that live on land, things that you'll have heard of, snakes, scorpions, spiders, also some ticks. Australia has the most dangerous venomous tick, the paralysis tick, in eastern Australia. A number of insects are venomous. I'm sure you're all familiar with bees and wasps and some of the stinging ants. Then there are the centipedes and, in fact, a few mammals like the Australian platypus and a number of shrews outside of Australia are venomous. Platypus is not dangerous to humans, but the sting from the uh, um, male platypus is very, very painful, so not to be encouraged. In the marine environment, many marine animals rely on venom, and that includes jellyfish, stinging fish, uh, the blue-ringed octopus, cones, shells, corals, etc., many others, anemones, um, and so on. Then there are the animals that are poisonous. These are animals that are not producing a venom as either um, a way of acquiring prey or as a defence, but instead you have to actually eat the animal. And in the terrestrial environment, there are a number that have quite potent toxins, some of the amphibians. I'm sure we've all heard of the poison dart frogs from particularly South America. And there are a few birds, particularly the pitahui in New Guinea, which uh, contain these poisons. In the marine environment, there are many poisonous animals. In, amongst the fish in particular, there are things like fugu, uh, which is notorious for killing people that eat these fish, um, particularly in Asia. And of course, fugu is a delicacy in Japanese restaurants, very expensive. You know you've been to a good restaurant if you just get the first stage of tetrodotoxin poisoning with tingling around the lips, and a bad restaurant if you die. Um, it used to be that many scores of Japanese died from going to the wrong restaurant, um, but they claim to have reduced that to maybe only 20 or 30 a year. Then there's ciguatera. There are some parts of the Pacific where the rate of ciguatera poisoning from eating fish, and of course many of these Pacific Islanders, fish is a staple part of their diet, one in five members of the population will have ciguatera poisoning every year. Hugely common. Of course, there are poisonous plants and mushrooms, and lastly, um, bacteria that produce toxins. And as a toxinologist, clinical toxinologist, I do not deal with the effects of bacterial toxins. That's dealt with by microbiologists. So that pretty picture just shows an example of the range of animals that can produce toxins, either as venoms or as poisons. So some definitions. What is toxinology? Toxinology is the science of toxic substances such as venoms and poisons produced by living organisms, such as snakes, spiders, etc. But the important thing is toxins come from living organisms. Clinical toxinology is that specialist area of uh, medical expertise that deals with the diagnosis and treatment of people affected by these toxins, toxin-induced diseases. What defines an animal as venomous? And this is an area of some contention in the scientific literature at the moment. Uh, we're on one side of that argument, taking the more traditional view, which we believe to be correct. And that is that venom is used by an animal for one or more specific purposes. Subduing or capturing uh, or killing prey. And that's why many venomous animals are venomous. It's not to harm us, it's to help them feed. Prey predigestion. And lastly, defending against predators. Certainly for the honeybee, the venom for the honeybee is not required to gain food. Honeybees don't take other insects, etc. It is purely defensive. 
The effects of venom on humans may be entirely extraneous to the function of venom in some cases. Interestingly, if we looked at funnel web spider venom as an example, and this was one reason it was very hard to make an antivenom. It was many decades of work before CSL perfected the antivenom. Most mammals are relatively immune to a funnel web spider bite, so cats and dogs in general will not be harmed. Just some higher primates, such as humans, appear to be susceptible. They have receptors in their nervous system that are targeted by the venom, and this is purely coincidence, because obviously funnel web spiders have not evolved to eat humans. There's a slight size difference. So I said I'm a clinical toxinologist. What things do clinical toxinologists need to know? Well, first of all, we're clinicians. We need to be uh, medical doctors, and we need to have maybe skills in a particular area and in the future that will probably, uh, clinical toxinologists will probably be drawn from specialist areas like emergency medicine. But that's not the case in this early stage because I'm one of the very first to pioneer this new field. So I'm not an emergency medicine specialist. You need to have an understanding of the fauna and flora, an understanding of the toxins, familiarity with the spectrum of clinical effects, an ability to use that information for diagnosis. Sometimes it's simple. Uh, Fred Bloggs comes in saying, I've been bitten by my pet tiger snake. That happened for me last night. I'm still waiting on more calls about Fred Bloggs. That's not his real name. And how, what's developing with his tiger snake bite. Though it is getting better, he's had antivenom. Um, but sometimes people don't know that they've been bitten by a venomous animal, even a snake. And I've seen a number of cases over the years of snake bite in Australia, in South Australia particularly, where the person didn't even know they were bitten by a snake. You also need to understand that the treatments, how to de deploy them appropriately. So what about the department that I'm in? Well, we're based at the Wounds and Children's Hospital, so it's only a short walk for me to come to this meeting. What do we do? Well, we do a number of things, and the most important is a clinical service. We provide an expert consultative service on diagnosis and management of toxin-induced diseases, particularly things like snake bite, spider bite, etc., as you can see there, to health professionals throughout SA and beyond. And beyond means um, the rest of Australia and sometimes the rest of the world. We regularly get consulted about cases outside of Australia. We develop and disseminate medical resource information on toxinology globally. We run the most important website in this field and have done for nearly 20 years. Um, we provide education and teaching services on toxinology to the health sector in Adelaide, in SA, in Australia and globally. And Kay already mentioned the uh, clinical toxinology short course, which I have a slide on uh, a little bit later. And of course we do conduct research. There's not a huge amount of time for that because we're so busy with all of the other things that we're doing. Because we're small. We now have two doctors, which is great from my point of view. For the first 20 plus years of the department, there was only one doctor, and that was me. So I was on call 24-7, 365 days a year. It's very nice now to only be on call one in two. We have one scientist who backs up the work that we're doing, etc. Are there similar departments elsewhere in Australia? No. There are virtually none anywhere in the world. We're a fairly special department. Um, and we provide a service, um, as I said, um, essentially globally, but certainly beyond SA. This is the clinical toxinology short course. That's uh, a photo um, that was taken uh, at the last course at the end of 2019. So we managed to get it in before COVID struck. We run these courses every two years and have done since 1997. Both our faculty and the doctors who attend the course come from around the world. So we've, we've taught doctors from maybe 50 odd countries um, around the world from most continents, not from Antarctica, um, but there's not much call for toxinology in Antarctica. 
So envenoming has made it into history in a number of ways in terms of bites. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the story of Cleopatra, the self-inflicted death by envenoming from snake bite. I don't think there is absolute agreement on what sort of snake actually caused this. Um, so I won't bother to go into that. And of course, there are many instances throughout history of poisoning by plants or mushrooms. This is just one of those. And I don't intend talking further about plants and mushrooms, but just to let you know, we do get involved in that. And in fact, in the mushroom area, we've just been the leaders in reclassifying mushroom poisoning globally. So that will be the new standard way of defining types of mushroom poisoning, probably for a number of years to come on the global scene. Toxins um, are very diverse, and any given venom usually has many toxins within it. An example of that would be cone snails, and particularly cone snails from northern Australian waters. This is one of the early um, separations, venom separations for one of the cone snails, Conus geographus, um, and showing the vast range of activities within that venom. Nearly all of the components in this venom, unlike some snake venoms, are small molecular weight peptides. And each peptide is subtly different in a, on a molecular basis, but sometimes markedly different in terms of its target and its effect. Um, this graph was actually generated by a medical student working in Salt Lake City, uh, US, many uh, decades ago. Um, and he tested the venom by injecting it directly into the brain of the test animal. Um, and it produced all of these varying effects depending on which particular fraction of the venom uh, he used. So um, some of the mice became uncoordinated, some were swinging their heads, some were walking around in a circular motion, uh, etc. As a result, these venoms uh, are being used by the pharmaceutical industry to develop whole new classes of drugs to treat a wide variety of conditions, including pain, uh, diabetes, uh, epilepsy, etc. And it's, we've just started on that journey. What are the factors affecting uh, envenoming? The impact of envenoming, particularly looking in this case uh, at snake bite. So the level of community knowledge about prevention and treatment is very important. Do the people understand the real risks and the need for urgent care? And all of these factors are things that we need to consider not just in Australia, but when we're trying to help countries outside of Australia. And I'm going to talk about that um, shortly, about our work in Myanmar. So these are all things that we had to think about. What's the availability of appropriate healthcare facilities? In Australia, it's generally quite good. But in many parts of the world where snake bite is common, it's not good. So is the level of the facility and staffing adequate? Does it have the capacity to treat? Does it have antivenom? Can patients afford treatment costs? And can they afford the costs of getting to that treatment? And for many parts of the developing tropical world, the answer to all those questions is no. And that's why there's such a toll. Antivenom availability, quality, effectiveness and affordability are all important issues. And then there's the role of traditional healers and their ilk. Are they delaying effective treatment? Often they are. Are they using damaging treatments? Very frequently they are. So let's now focus on snake bite. Um, again, getting up close and personal. This is a brown snake. Um, that was threatening to strike when I took the photo. Um, snake bite has been ignored by health authorities and the medical profession by and large for a very long time. It's only in the last few years, and I'm talking about less than five years, that it started as a result of agitation from a number of people, including myself, to get onto the global agenda. As a result, the late Kofi Annan, before he died, um, became aware of the importance and promoted the idea that snake bite is the biggest public health crisis you've never heard of. So what happens when someone is, is bitten? So we, we can't have a talk on envenoming and bites and stings without seeing a bite occur. So here we've got a bite occurring. And this is a um, dugite from Western Australia 
that I photographed biting in uh, Adelaide. And you can see the snake hung on. Hmm? Two minutes and then questions. Oh, okay. I thought I had much longer. No, no. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, no, this wasn't a real person. It was a fake hand, um, but it makes the point. So snake bite is a neglected tropical disease. It's arguably the most neglected tropical disease affecting the poor. It's a poverty trap disease, an occupational disease. And we need to do a great deal more um, to assist all of the people suffering this disease. It affects millions of people every year. It kills between 100 and 200,000 people plus every year in the world and uh, maims in excess of 400,000 people a year. That's about 100 times more than landmines. Um, so it's, it's a major problem. It is completely under-resourced. Um, it's something that, as a global community, we need to try and do something about. And at least now we have support from the WHO in principle, but that doesn't follow with money. So that's something we will need to do. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I had an hour, so I have oh, a lot more to talk about. Well, but if, if, we, if you'd like to answer questions after, you can get another five minutes mm -hmm. and then answer questions. Well, why, why don't we? No, no. Why don't we open it up to questions okay, now? We'll do that. Okay. Mm. So I'll open it up to questions. <laughs> yes, Jeff. You've just spent 30 years of celebrating the toxicology department at the Women's and Children's. I can recall in 1980 you had a goal to set up toxinology or toxicology as a specialty in itself. Yes. Can you just give us a, a rough, that pathway of one, how you became so interested in, in, um, in this subject and how you actually got it from that to, to the next step? Okay. So I'm a POM by birth, came out here as a child, aged 11. And like many uh, immigrants into Australia, Australia's fauna was fascinating, probably more fascinating than native-born Australians. Um, and so I, I developed an interest in our fauna, um, particularly, no, not immediately at 11. When I first arrived, I was terrified of snakes oh, okay. and spiders. Um, and then got uh, involved in keeping Australian native fauna, particularly reptiles, and ultimately, including venomous snakes. I so I, I've caught and collected, uh, caught and, and kept a number of uh, venomous snakes. I've never kept taipans, and that's a, that's a deliberate idea. choice, but I've had brown snakes, tiger snakes, death adders, mulga snakes, black snakes, copperheads, etc. Um, I think I, when I went through... Peter remembers the collection, I think. Yes, he does. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't expect that would be of any relevance to me in medicine. Um, so when I qualified in medicine uh, in the mid-70s, um, I thought I'd end up being a surgeon. But in fact, I, even from a, my first few months as an intern at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, I was being asked to come and help with the treatment of any snake bite patients because people knew as a medical student, I knew about this stuff. And so that my two careers were going in parallel for a while and in the end, it became clear that toxinology was really important. And so the um, Department of Health invited me to form the toxinology department in 1990. Yeah, and the, yeah. the, rest is, the rest is history. Uh, so you've told us a lot about snake bites, but you've said nothing about, for instance, a, a man out in a paddock, uh, he's got a vehicle, he's uh, perhaps uh, five, six, seven miles, 10 mile away from a, a doctor's surgery. What does a, a, a by a snake under those circumstances? Okay, so a little bit of talk about that was in the latter part of the lectures. I, I apologize, I we'll didn't. You, we'll invite you back to talk about snakes. Yeah, I, I somehow didn't register the, the time constraints um, and I apologize for that. Uh, the situation where you're out alone well away from medical care is a really difficult one. There isn't a simple answer. Uh, the glib answer is to say be very careful and don't get bitten. Because if you do get bitten, and, and prevention like most things in medicine is the most important thing. Don't get the disease or the injury or whatever. That's the best way to get a good outcome. Um, but if you are unfortunate enough to be bitten, 
You need to know what you're going to do, so that involves the pressure bandage, your mobilisation, first aid. If you've got a radio to call for help, that's probably better than driving uh, a distance um, to seek help because you might suddenly lose consciousness, um, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes after being bitten in that setting. And if you're driving, you might crash the car and that might kill you. So um, it, it isn't something which there is a, a, a clear and easy answer to. Um, having said that, in Australia, I think most people that live at that higher risk are aware of the risk and they practice prevention. So we don't see many farmers bitten by snakes. I've seen a number over the years, but compared to the risk that they're in, I think the number is small. Mm. Well, as I've run out of time, and we will invite you back again to talk sure. about snakes. <laughs> and it's, uh, thank you very much for that. That's the most interesting talk. And um, I notice everyone's still here, so they didn't feel too obliged to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and they've missed some of the and gory they, photographs. Uh, next, they're warned for next time. We'll, we'll <laughs> So in, um, in thanking you, uh, we make a donation uh, to, on your behalf to the, uh, mitigate the and contain COVID-19 pandemic alongside continuing the efforts to eradicate polio worldwide through the Rotary Foundation. So thank you. our gift to you and thank you very much for speaking. That's My wonderful. pleasure. If everyone could thank Julian and Julian.